the reason we're here today, Connor Jackson and the Easter Thieves. And I think we should get going because it's time for some entertainment. So glasses on and welcome to my world of fantasy. Connor Jackson and the Easter Thieves by Nick B. Ponter. That's me. Connor Jackson and the Easter Thieves is based on the story Connor Jackson and the Memory Thieves. Oh, just how divine, squawked Felicity Forsyth Twike. The chattering crowd fell silent as a high-pitched voice screeched through the PA system in Lower Moorhampton's village green. The mayoress and owner of the food factory was standing on a wooden podium, surveying the crowd with a snooty look on her face. Welcome! It gives me immense pleasure as your mayoress to invite you all to my own Easter fire. Eat my sausages and feast on my punch. Everything here is for free. With her nose high in the air, she waited for an eager round of applause, but was instead met with a smattering of reluctant hand clapping. She indignantly stared at the gathered residents before pompously screeching again. Without further ado, I formally declare this prestigious event open, she announced, and left the podium. Just as she was about to throw a burning torch into the wood, something unexpected happened. A jet of flame suddenly shot up from the base, igniting the fire. With great glee, the parents and excited children watched as the flames crackled, clawed and climbed up the dry wood until the whole pile was ablaze. The residents did not know how the fire was lit and neither did they care. My name is Connor Jackson and I know how the fire was started. Had the people paid attention, they would have witnessed molehills suddenly sprouting up around the fire and a closer look would have revealed an orange glow radiating out of these muddy mounds. Yes, the moles lit the fire. And how do I know that? Well, that's because I have lived with them right under our very feet and know things beyond your imagination. They store our memories in glass jars, in vast underground warehouses, and administer the allocation of all creatures going back to new lives on the surface. You probably can't imagine they have shops, discos, restaurants, workshops, and even fur salons. Yes, there is a mysterious world below the Molehamptons. It wasn't so long ago that Felicity Forsyth Twike attempted to sabotage Christmas by stealing all the presents from Sergeant Dawson's office. She was always up to no good and a free Easter fire event quite out of character. Surely something was about to happen. Darn ungrateful riffraff! Shame on them! Uh, absolutely, Auntie Felicity. Look at all you have done for them over the years and now this free event you have generous, generously arranged, replied Bartholomew Forsyth Twike. They will have a lesson in gratitude tomorrow morning, she venomously spat out. They looked at each other with sly grins before bursting out into devious laughter. <laughs> Deep in the shadows, the Kennedy brothers, accompanied by other petty crooks, paid a visit to each house where children lived. The sound of breaking glass went completely amiss, as well as a break-in at the supermarket where the entire supply of Easter eggs and fresh eggs was stolen. By the time the Easter fire event was formally closed, the nasty villains had sneaked back into the darkness. Their crimes yet to be discovered. It didn't take long to notice something was wrong as I walked back home and heard uproar from the villagers. Our house has been burgled, I heard. All the Easter eggs have been stolen came another shout of anger. 
a police car screeched into Trout Lane and Sergeant Dawson, the village policeman, squeezed himself out and waddled towards me. Oh, good job you are here. We need to speak. I've already heard the news. Yes, the whole village has been robbed. A catastrophe. And what are you going to do about it? The, me? But, but you're the village policeman. Yes, but, but Mr Jackson, you somehow saved Christmas not too long ago. Surely you can help again, he pleaded and barged past into my house. He was quite correct, of course. At Christmas, I had asked my furry friends below the ground for help, and Christmas was saved. I knew I now had to turn to them again. Leave it to me, Sergeant. Joe and Gavin Kennedy, not the brightest crooks, sat in the back of a lorry amidst pile of Easter eggs they had been ordered to guard. Dressed in their customary red tracksuits, they started opening their plunder and reveled at the sight of mountains of chocolate eggs. Their greedy hands stripped off the wrappers and smashed eggshells before stuffing the stolen goodies into their slobbering mouths. Smearing their faces with brown chocolate and their tracksuits caked in egg, they gorged on the food until reaching bursting point. When they finally settled amongst their hoard, a rumbling noise came deep from below from Gavin's stomach, followed by a slow raspberry sound. <clears throat> With a contented look, he started giggling at the noise. Joe, not wanting to miss out on the fun, started belching loudly, <clears throat> laughing his head off in the process. Like in a competition, the brothers squeezed out different sounds and smelly gases inside the confined space, until their eyes became heavy and slowly. I approached one of the mole hills in my garden and removed the earth at the top. Time was of the essence, and I only had the remaining hours of darkness to foil the Forsyth twikes. Two eyes shone up at me. This is an urgent message for Colonel Pickle. I un I'm instructed, pushed a hosepipe down the hole and waited. I was relieved when I heard a familiar voice through the pipe. Hello, hello. I need your help again, I said, and explained my quickly thought out plan. Leave it to me, replied Colonel Pickle. Sergeant Dawson nervously paced up and down, inundated with calls reporting burglaries. He promised everyone he had it in hand. Since he was not privy to my plan, he fretted about how so much chocolate and eggs could be replaced in such a short time. Just as he was about to sip his beloved tea and munch a biscuit, his phone rang yet again. Uh, yes, Mrs Forsyth Twyke, I, I've heard all about it. Uh, I agree. How could anyone do such a monstrous thing? Yes, the poor children. And you care for them all. The cheerful cackle of laughter was the last thing he heard as he put the phone down. Now... Whilst the children in the Mauldhamptons were tucked up in bed, Colonel Pickle stood in front of row upon row of his special forces moles, primed for action before mysterious events started deep below the ground. Soldiers, you've been briefed and know what to do. Shortly after, a huge molehill right next to the River Angler burst open and a team of highly trained special forces moles streamed out into the dark night. They headed straight for a secret lair underneath an overhanging bush at the riverbank and uncovered a fleet of toy boats, usually used for scavenging. But today, under the supervision of a duck called Basil, their mission was to acquire fresh eggs in the local area. In complete silence and secrecy, the moles stealthily set off upstream. They started near the town of Angleton, and at each farm, the same story played out. Basil explained what had happened in Lower Molehampton, and the hens readily agreed, leading the moles to their cache of eggs, and, with loud clucking, even delivered any remaining. With their boats filled with eggs and rafts towed behind for extra capacity, the moles 
floated back down the river. The entire supply of Lower Mordhampton's fresh eggs had been secured and their mission was complete. At 2.30 they were met by a fluffle of rabbits with wheelbarrows. Now these Flemish giant rabbits are the largest domestic ones known. I should now admit that these rabbits actually live with me because when I decided to leave the mole world extra security was needed. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is another story. At the same time, a second Special Forces team exited near the village shops under the supervision of a dog called Ludwig. They plundered the supermarket of its entire supply of chocolate bars and tin foil, then looted paint and small brushes from Mr Tinker's ironmonger store. Another fluffle of Flemish giant rabbits assisted the small furry moles to carry these heavy items. The third group of Special Forces moles were the military engineers, armed with screwdrivers, cutting equipment and blowtorches. They exited in my garden and tried hard not to make too much noise as they acquired drain pipes, guttering plenty of pots and gas cookers from nearby streets. And below the ground, hundreds of industrious moles had hastily set up a factory. They now sat at tables equipped with the tools just looted by the scavenging teams on the surface, eagerly waiting for their part in my plan. Were you to walk into my kitchen, you would be met by a very strange sight indeed. The Flemish rabbits now really proving their worth had turned the room into a makeshift cooking station in no time. Some were ripping the wrappers off the chocolate bars, others threw the brown chunks into large metal pots, whilst some were on mixing duty. The gas cookers melted the blocks into a splashing, steaming sludge of melted chocolate. And now, standing on my kitchen surface, the rabbits poured the liquid onto a piece of guttering which led to a large molehill with a drain pipe protruding out of the top. Down this pipe, pot upon pot of frothing fluid flowed below. As soon as all of the bars had been melted, it was time to boil the eggs. The pots were cleaned and the steam of the boiling water soon vented up through my house and escaped out of the open windows. My house now resembled a steam train running at full speed as hundreds of eggs rattled in the boiling water. The cooked eggs were then rolled down another piece of guttering into a second molehill. But some rotten eggs were kept for disposal at a later stage. Remember that? The last egg disappeared into the darkness below at exactly half past four. Lights slowly started appearing along the river Angler as farmers arose for their early morning duties. It didn't take them too long to realise that there were no eggs to be collected on that morning. At the same time, the first shift arrived at the supermarket to find the shelves for chocolate bars, Easter eggs and fresh eggs were completely bare. Sergeant Dawson was nervously munching on his beloved biscuits. He had been sitting at his desk the whole night and it was still dark when the first call started coming in. Ah, well done, Mr. Jackson, he said to himself, beaming from ear to ear. Meanwhile, Deep down under the Molehamptons, liquid chocolate gushed out of pipes in the ceiling and straight into pots, moving on a conveyor belt, with loud gurgling sounds and hard-boiled eggs shot out of other pipes into baskets with a loud clattering sound. In a well-organised military operation, the moles, who had been eagerly waiting, sprang into action and distributed the pots and baskets to zealous teams ready to decorate the eggs. Sharpish now, no time to waste, shouted Colonel Pickle. Like a conductor of an orchestra, he perfectly timed and coordinated every move. One team of hard-working moles dunked hard-boiled eggs into big pots of different coloured paint and finished them off with a quick blast from hair dryers, borrowed from the fur salons. Another team was responsible for shaping chocolate eggs, a task they had never done before. When the chocolate solidified into a pliable mixture, the moles grabbed out with their tiny paws to form them into remarkably interesting shapes 
and passed them on to another team to cover them in tinfoil. The painters then finished them with bright and colourful decoration. Dutiful moles now stood next to strange-looking shiny blobs as they proudly presented their work to, you guessed it, Colonel Pickle. Apparently, he was also not aware of how Easter eggs should actually look like and congratulated them on a job well done. Marvellous job, soldiers! Mr Jackson and his rabbits now have one hour of darkness to distribute the eggs to the children. Lower Molehampton awoke to a most unexpected surprise. Bewildered parents picked up sparkling blobs from their doorstep and looked around, wondering where they had come from. Hmm. The excited children were extra thrilled because their parents had put so much effort into making their own chocolate eggs. Handmade presents are always accepted with gratitude, even when the shapes this year were rather odd. Oh, it's so beautiful. Thank you. Did you make it? shouted a child. Wait, look at this. Why are there so many paw marks on the chocolate? shouted another. The parents were obviously not able to answer the questions and quickly ushered their kids into the garden, praying the same miracle had happened. And the Easter Bunny had mysteriously delivered Easter eggs as well. Although not only the shape of the chocolate eggs, but also the colours of the Easter eggs were somewhat out of the ordinary this year. Parents would talk for years to come about the strange events this Easter Sunday. Oh, I just can't wait to see the faces of the crying children, whooped Felicity Forsyth Twike as she and Bartholomew drove around Lower Molehampton. But their anticipation was short-lived, as they witnessed joyful children uncovering colourful Easter eggs hidden in their gardens. Oh, Auntie, I, I just don't understand. The Kennedy brothers stole everything. Neither do I. The horrible brats are running around with Easter eggs. How can this be? Our plan has been foiled yet again. My neighbour, Mr Lawnsworthy, was standing in his garden, looking at the outside of his house in confusion. Hmm. He found his drain pipes attached very loosely to the brick wall, and even stranger, there was a layer of thick chocolate caked on the inside. Looking up, he also noticed pieces of guttering were missing. He scratched his head and looked suspiciously at a truck parked at the entrance of Trout Lane. Hmm. A gust of wind blew the strong smell of eggs straight past him. Phew. And you might be asking yourself, what of the Kennedy brothers? It might not come as a surprise that they woke up from their slumber in a sticky situation, and quite literally, writhing around in a lake of chocolate to stay warm overnight they had turned up the temperature of the reefer unit and the chocolate was now trickling out of the truck, forming a sticky pool on the road. Sergeant Dawson arrived in Trout Lane for the second time in just a few hours. Felicity and Bartholomew stopped at the village green and stood atop the podium in despair, surveying the joyful scenes as the whole village took part in a mass Easter egg hunt. Had they been more aware, they would have seen molehills popping up around them. But the children noticed something was amiss and stopped playing as a rumbling sound and vibrations came from deep below the ground. Then a salvo of eggs was fired from the molehills and splattered straight on Felicity and Bartholomew. The slimy goo ran down their faces as they let out a long scream of disgust. The stench poo, of the rotten eggs soon entered everyone's noses, but by no means did this stop the crowd's enjoyment. The children were delirious, the parents delighted, and the Forsyth Twikes distressed. Easter is my favourite time of the year. The world comes back to life as frosty nights give way to longer, warmer days. It always fascinates me when the first buds burst into life and flowers squeeze out of the hard ground to explode in their vibrant colours. Miraculously, daffodils all of a sudden started popping up. 
around me as though someone was pushing them out. Then a molehill sprouted up right between my feet. Happy Easter! came a voice from below. And happy Easter to you too, Colonel Pickle. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Connor Jackson and the Easter Thieves. <laughs>